U.S. for they will show gaps where um, Latinos are underrepresented, Latinos are facing other challenges, and you'll see that show up in data as gaps. We wanted to understand why that is and to really then try to think through how that's happening to us when we know who we really are and we know we're not deficient. So then why, why these gaps and how do we now begin to address those gaps? So the first growth factor is the population. We're large and growing group. In 1980, there was 14 million of us. Um, now, today, there's over 65 million Latinos in the US. And in about 26 years or less, there will be over 100 million. And that is something that's inevitable. Doesn't matter what you do at the border, there will be 100 million Latinos in this country within your lifetimes. That, that will happen, right? And so that's an important shift. Some people can point to that and, and foment fears and hatreds. Um, we look at that as an opportunity, but that's just the beginning of why Latinos are an opportunity for the United States. The other one is that, as mentioned, we have a younger age, so, but it's growing. So what this means back, you know, when we were only 14 million of us back in 1980, our median age was probably that of an adolescent, maybe a little more than an adolescent. Um, today, our, we're still the youngest population in the U.S., but our median age has risen, and we're about 29.7 is our median age, which means that now we have this much larger population, but also a much larger percentage of this larger population that is contributing, producing, right? Because we're not, we're not adolescents where you have to be consuming at that stage. So that's the second growth factor that compounds on top of the first one. And the third one was mentioned is our education levels are improving. We're the one group that's showing the biggest increase when you compare the children's education to the parents. So we are still underrepresented in schools were underrepresented across the board, so there are still serious issues with access to good schools, access to education, but Latinos are finding a way to overcome those challenges, and Latino parents are finding ways to educate their children to a much higher level than they were educated. And this goes back for 30, 40 years. This is a consistent trend within the Latino population. So when we, we put all those three growth factors together, it's this enormous tsunami that's forming that's already inserting itself in all aspects of the U.S. culture and U.S. economy already. They're not the future, it's already happening where you can see you know, the Latino music, uh, a lot of things that are culturally Latino are increasingly now becoming mainstream in the U.S., but also economically we're having a bigger and bigger impact. As you can imagine now, we're driving almost all the growth in every profession. Again, we're underrepresented as professionals, but if you look at the growth that's happening in engineers, doctors, lawyers, government employees, 60 to 80% of the growth is being driven by Latinos today. We're not talking about the future. That's already happening. Right, so this is this big Latino tsunami that is now washing over the country at all levels of it, right? And you kind of have to ask yourself, how does that happen? So Latinos, we come here or we are born here usually in situations with extreme privations. We have less wealth, our parents have less education than the average, and we know there are biases. Often, if we're not documented, as was my case, we can't even access government support of any type, right? Yet, we are still finding a way to overcome those challenges, right? And so part of it is that this ambition that we have and this innate sense of willingness to invest in the future, to invest in family, we will sacrifice for our children in, in that process of trying to build a better life for our families. 
we are actually lifting our communities. We're finding ways to build community. Wherever Latinos show up in different neighborhoods, you see those, la those neighborhoods become better for everyone who lives there, right? Because Latinos are, are naturally trying to build communities to support each other with what little they have. And the results are this, that we can see now after 30 years of that phenomena happening, Latinos are really driving a lot of economic growth in the country, right? So our focus is entrepreneurship. So we look at that from sort of the economic impact. 65 million of us already today, our GDP of US Latinos is $3.2 trillion already today. That's not tomorrow, that's right now. 3.2 trillion is the fifth largest economy on the planet. So that's who we are. There's, we're bigger than every, economically bigger than every country of Latin America, bigger than every country of Africa, bigger than almost every country of Asia, and bigger than almost every country of Europe. Already today, and we haven't even gotten to the 100 million yet. Right, so that's who we are uh, so economically. We're already making that kind of an impact. Um, the next thing from an entrepreneurial perspective, there's already more than five million companies that are owned by Latinos in the US. So, and even more important, those companies are already generating over 800 billion in revenues. And a lot of our companies, because Latino companies are younger and starting out, they might be part of the informal economy, so this isn't even measuring the real impact, which is probably closer to a trillion dollars of economic impact that these Latino companies are already having today. Again, that's not in the future, which is only gonna be bigger. You know, the other thing that we measure is the growth rate of the number of companies. In the last 15 years, Latino, the number of Latino companies, of which are already 5 million plus, grew by 57%, compared to only 5% for white-owned companies in the country. So Latino, the number of Latino companies are growing 10 times faster. Again, much faster than our population because, again, it has to do with those other dynamics. <laughs> More of us are older, so we can create companies. You can't easily create a company when you're an adolescent, although some of us do. Um, the other thing is that with more education, it also gives you more ability to do things, right? So a much greater number of us are in a position to create companies. Um, the other interesting fact is that those Latino companies are growing revenues at more than 50% faster so on average, those Latino-owned companies are growing revenues faster. So again, which is another important dynamic that's happening. And then that manifests in terms of job creation, that Latino business owners are creating jobs at more than twice the rate of US white businesses in the US. Again, when you think about that, you know, for me, and we don't have it up here, but the most important statistic is that our data showed that on average, jobs at a Latino-owned company in the U.S. provide better benefits across the board. And again, we don't know exactly the causation for that, but you can, you can posit that it's perhaps because we are a people that are closer to the privations. And so therefore, when we have an ability to create um, a job, we're, we're very conscious of that. And so we're creating um, situations that are gonna be the kinds of jobs that we would have wanted, but maybe we didn't have access to. And then the other reason why for us this is important is uh, Latino business owners in the US have nine times the wealth of a Latino who doesn't own a business. And again, we want to help foment more wealth creation within our community. And if you're a Latino business owner, you're more likely to um, put back into your community, right? Because you're usually hiring and, and sourcing from others that are 
you know, in your network. And so a lot more of that will come back into our communities. Now, having said that, we employ a lot of people who are not Latino, right? In fact, most employees of, as our companies grow, are not Latino, right? In the beginning, a lot of them will, will be Latino because you start with a small network, but once you start to grow, you're, you're literally, like every other company, creating economic impact for all of society. And then finally, we did a calculation to say, well, if you play this out, Latinos on, have been creating companies for a, a lower, less amount of time than non-Latinos in the US. And also, we're a younger population. So our companies, on average, are younger. As these companies continue to grow, what would it look like once the average the, a Latino company in the U.S. reaches the average size of a company in the U.S. And if that can happen in the, last, in the next 10 years or so, it would add about $3.3 trillion to the U.S. economy, additional per year. That's the single largest economic opportunity for America, is Latinos, right? That's why we believe we can help lift our country's economy by empowering Latino entrepreneurship. So the other thing that our data shows is some of the challenges. And again, um, if, if you are a Latino in the US, I probably don't need to explain it to you, but um, th there are biases and challenges that um, Latinos, any non-traditional business owner will face. But for Latinos, the way that shows up in our research is Latinos who um, have better metrics for their business, again, better metrics, they apply for a bank loan, they're 60% less likely to get that bank loan. It's not because they didn't know how to fill out the form, it's not because they were lacking in some way. In fact, their metrics are equivalent or better and so you have to kind of ask why that happens. And again, we don't believe that there are necessarily evil forces out there. And most people we think are trying to do the right thing. But there are perceptions that people and institutions have, expectations that they have. And some of it might be fueled by the media. Others could be fueled by just their own heuristical examples where the human brain starts to begin to see patterns without understanding why those patterns happen and might conclude things about non-traditional business owners. It might be a woman business owner, an African-American business owner, or a Latino who's <laughs> applying for the loan, but in that split second that the loan officer has to make an adjudication, they make one decision versus another decision. And in the end of, those, of all of that, without them being consciously biased, because they're not really aware of it, um, is this phenomena, right? Because we don't think banks are leaving, trying to leave money on the table on purpose. But what that does indicate is that they are making loans to people that are higher risk than Latinos. And probably doing the same thing when it comes to making loans to people who are not women versus women or people who are not black versus black, right? Again, because everyone will have their own biases, and it doesn't mean that even just by it being a Latino banker that they're automatically gonna be better, right? We, we all have to be conscious of, of that process. <laughs> that are, are we really giving fair opportunity to everyone? Especially when we don't have a lot of time to make that calculus. And again, we, again, we're not out there to tell people how to be better bankers. We just want other, whoever is interested to begin to look at that and figure out how do we make that situation better? Because once we do that, it unlocks potential for everyone, not just Latinos. It will lift the American economy. Oh, let me go back. The, the biggest access to capital gap, though, is in venture capital. Our data shows that 19% of Latino businesses in the US are in tech. 
That compares that only 14% of the white-owned businesses in the U.S. are in tech. So Latinos actually over-index on tech. That might be because we're a younger population and technology might be you know, more accessible for younger people. But we're trying to be in tech. But we're getting less than 2%. Today, it's much less than 2% of the VC funding that's out there is going to Latino founders. This is a huge issue. Because if you think about it, Latinos within the US are one of the largest, fastest growing emerging markets. Most people won't look at us that way because we're within the US. So we won't be perceived as an emerging market because most people's mindset is emerging markets happen out there and in other places. So, so there's not a whole lot of attention yet being put onto this question of what will happen to the American economy if we don't figure out a way to address that. Because these tech companies can't continue to grow and have good outcomes if we don't find a way to increase the access to VC and angel funding. And then the, the other thing that's important for growth of companies is access to contracts. And our data shows that you know, corporations will give smaller contracts to Latinos, plus those contracts take longer for a Latino company to win them. And when it comes to the government, the federal government in particular, Latinos will get contracts that are 31 times smaller. I mean, a gap that big isn't easily explained by some kind of structural deficiency that might exist within our community. That has to do with lack of access to networks and also, again, people's perceptions and their biases when they're choosing who to be a provider. And you know, what, what we try to do is figure out a way to put this out there so that people can look at that with the assumption that most are going to try to do the right thing and figure out how do they begin to change to address that. Because once we do, once we think about what can unlock that, it's going to help much more than Latinos. The, those same processes are holding back unfairly women and black business owners. So our focus in trying to address that as, at a, as you know, a, a nonprofit, as Elban, is using our research we also have these biz the business scaling program and the startup accelerator at Stanford for Latina and Latino business owners. And then we are also building an ecosystem where we invite everyone and anyone who wants to join us to figure out how to um, use that data, how to get involved. Um, if you're a capital provider, we welcome you. We work with all the banks. We, work with v we welcome all VC companies, angel investors. And we'll connect them to our founders. We'll connect them to other organizations that we know. Um, so we're doing a lot to try to address those issues. We have already over 1,200 companies that have gone through our program. You'll hear from two um, in a few minutes um, that will be on the panel. But they're everywhere across the US. So any, any major metro in the US, we can gather together a group of 20, 30, 40, 100 people that have gone through our program. And we also, you know, through them, try to build a bigger and stronger community. And we'll do events around the country. They'll usually um, lead those events, our alumni, and then invite us, we'll give a talk, we'll try to connect with others. We, we do a lot to try to help these local ecosystems build up around this idea of Latino entrepreneurship, but by extension, Anyone who's underrepresented, we expect, will benefit from, from that kind of activity. This graph shows during the pandemic, um, it was a hard time for any business owner. And so the, uh, the growth rate over the three years beginning in, um, I think this is 2019, right when the pandemic was, was going to start, until 2022, those three years, um, <coughs> White-owned businesses only grew by 9% over those three years, which, which makes sense, right? Because the pandemic was harsh for businesses. Latinos, by comparison, Latino businesses grew 25% over those same, that same period. 
the people that went through our program, they grew by 40% in those three years. And when we, the reason why we put this up there is really to highlight the impact of being in a supportive ecosystem, what that can do for you. Because we know that most Latinos don't have a fair ecosystem. We, we know that the same thing probably is true for black business owners or for women business owners. They have extra challenges. It's hard if you're doing a business no matter what ethnicity or what gender you are. But we know that there are these underrepresented groups that are gonna face these extra challenges. And it's not really what we can teach them through Stanford, and we have Stanford faculty that are, teach these classes with us. And they're the best teachers. We work with the Graduate School of Business, the number one business school literally on the planet. But that growth rate was not because of them. When the pandemic happened, they didn't know how to deal with it either. No one knew. The banks didn't know. And we, you know, the SBA administrator, Guzman, she, she didn't know how to deal with it either, right? Everyone was figuring it out. But because our alumni were connected to each other, they were communicating with each other, with us, and together as a community, as an ecosystem, with bankers and others that are part of our ecosystem, that was the outcome. And we put that up there to just encourage everyone to build ecosystems wherever you are. And as, in particular, we think these ecosystems are especially important for these communities that have been kept out of the mainstream. Because we have to be brought into the mainstream. There's no way America can continue to be a big economy the size that it needs to be if we are not all fully included. It, so, so that's just the big idea for us there is to just make sure that we highlight that, that ecosystems matter, why we invest time and energy in, in cultivating a strong one. And these are just some of the organizations that we, we work with. Um, there's too many to put up here. But I did want to give a shout out to VC Familia and Founder Familia. We have Alex here. So they're, they're also a similar nonprofit organization that's trying to do more to highlight um, Latino VCs, um, Latino angel investors, and Latino founders. And so we do a lot in collaboration with them in terms of ecosystem building across, across the US and Puerto Rico. But we will work with any organization, and a lot of them that are non-Latino organizations as well, because again, we know that our work um, has a lot of relevance to them. One of the organizations, by the way, um, Illumin Capital, um, they're a really strong partner of ours, and they're an LP. Um, again, they also, like us, have a strong connection with Stanford University, but their whole focus as a limited partner is to raise funds to then put those funds into Latina or black or women um, fund managers. Because the idea being that they're more likely to push that money out to founders um, that are in those communities. And again, as a way to address that, that, those challenges of why Latinos are only getting 2% of the VC funding, well, you know, there's, we need to put more money into these VC funds and others, um, you know, if you're a black-led or a woman um, VC fund or angel group, you probably are more likely not just to invest in black and women, but you're also more open to invest in Latinos, right? Because you will recognize the same dynamic. So that's who we are. I just want to take some time to like level set. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. We're gonna shift to the panel discussion. I'll have Eliane come up here and joined by Carolyn and Daniel, Daniela, but um, do we have any questions, any, any comments before we switch over to the panel? And they will be more interesting, I guarantee you guys, but, um, but I don't wanna just you know, put them up there and then you guys ask them the questions about the research, which you know, I don't want to put that on them. But if there are no questions about what I just talked about, we will switch over now to um, the panel discussion and if I can ask, um, Eliane, um, to come up. Yeah. Thank you.
All right. How's everybody doing? Great. Good? All right. So uh, it's not just going to be me. Uh, kind of awkward transition. But I do want to bring up Daniela and Carolyn, uh, who will join us. So uh, if you can come up on stage, yeah. Let's give a big welcome. Come on, let's go. So as, as they take their seats, I want to give some background. So my name is Elian Saduker. I'm the Senior Director of Programs at LBAN. Arturo Cáceres just talked about our research, and we have our event yearly, which you can put on your calendar somewhere between February and March uh, to join us at Stanford. It's kind of a wide month uh, that you got to kind of pencil in, but we'll, we'll definitely be sharing the date on our social media soon once we confirm it. So we have that part of our organization, which is the research, and then we have our programming, and, and Arturo had mentioned our two programs, so our Alban Business Scaling Program at Stanford and our Alban Startup Accelerator at Stanford. These programs are both nine weeks with two days at the beginning at Stanford, eight weeks online, and then two more days at Stanford where they get Stanford professors, you get content relatable to your business. So everything that we teach from, from the Stanford professors is how do you scale your business? So we directly impact the business, not just creating theories, or things that might happen years down the line, but things that are happening currently in your business, how do you scale and grow it? We then also add mentors. I know uh, Sergio is here, one of our mentors. Big shout out to Sergio, who's been a fantastic mentor. We also then do weekly webinars to tackle current topics and other content that's helpful to scale and grow. And finally, one of the things that Arturo mentioned is that ecosystem, right? So bringing in organizations like VC Familia, bringing in organizations like banks, and different partners that can come in, support, and help our founders. So that's the program in nine weeks, and then we continue to support, we continue to educate well after that. With that said, I have two fantastic Latinas that have gone through our program and that are alumni, and Arturo had shown over 1,200 <coughs> alumni that have gone through our program. And so we're just gonna talk to two of them here, but talk about the power of Alban, talk about why it's important, why they decided to join, and share some, some stories around that. Um, the scaling program happens twice a year, so our next one is in October. I'll share some more information around that. But we have Daniela from Business Nation who graduated just recently, a couple weeks ago, and then Carolyn Rods who's from Cohort 8 a couple of years ago and, and has been able to really scale and grow the business after our program. And so I want to give you both a big welcome. Thank you for joining us. And I just want to start, we'll start with Daniela and then Carolyn. Just kind of an open question of, you know, why did you want to join Elban and, and what was your journey through Elban like? And uh, just kind of share with us your, your journey. Bueno, gracias, Elian. Thank you. My name is Daniela Carvajalino, originally from Colombia. Yeah, we lost yesterday. We lost yesterday, but, you know, we're recovering who'd from that. Who'd you lose to? <laughs> eh, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> Argentina in the house here as well. And yeah, I'm very passionate about education. Like that is my one thing. I moved to the US not so long ago. And one of the reasons why I originally came to Elban was because we were in that scaling process that we grew our company in Latin America. And then you come to the US and it's like, oh yeah, start from zero. Like you have nothing. So I found in Elban a very interesting opportunity of continuing that growth that we were set to have in education, we work with small businesses. We do a lot of training in a very innovative way. And I was surprised with what I got because you, you originally come from for the knowledge. Like that's where you think is gonna be the most important. And of course, Stanford is amazing and the teachers are incredible. But like Arturo said, I think that the most powerful thing that I got out of the program was getting amazing friends that are now like family and network that I think is even more valuable than money and that, you know, raising funds is amazing, but you raise friends that get you to even bigger things. And that was kind of my experience at Elban. Awesome. Carolyn? Very similar to what Daniela said. And thanks for saying it was a couple years ago, because I think it was 2019 when yeah, I was right in the, before the pandemic. You <laughs> were the last cohort before the pandemic. It was pre-pandemic, pre uh, which feels like a couple of years ago in some ways. Uh, I'm Carolyn Rods. I'm the founder and CEO of Hello Alice. Uh, we're a digital platform for entrepreneurs. Uh, so for me, it was actually really difficult to decide to join an accelerator program because we run accelerator programs and we work with entrepreneurs all day long. And so it felt very 
awkward almost to think about applying for an accelerator program, uh, but I had heard about this LBAN thing from enough people and they were like, I promise it's gonna be really helpful for you and it's, it's a really incredible program. I had also been involved in a lot of different Latino focused organizations and to be honest, I always felt a little bit like like I didn't quite belong, like they weren't talking to companies like mine and it didn't feel like a place that I fit. And LBAN was really the first program that I joined and I was like, the, these are my people, like I get this, I really connect with these people. Like Daniela said, like a, a, a group of peers on like a level that I had never experienced, at least professionally. Uh, I think the most helpful thing for, for me was really meeting companies at a, a very similar stage, even though they were in very different places and very different industries, they were all struggling with the same um, issues around, you know, how to find and retain great talent, how to, you know, really build these relationships with your clients where you can continue to grow and scale, how to think about structuring your, you know, sales processes and all of the, the really tactical things that were so helpful. Um, I think the greatest takeaway for me may have been establishing a great relationship with my banker. It was something I always had a banker. I never thought about it that much. Honestly, every time they called me, I felt like it was a pain. We never took on debt, so it wasn't something I needed to deal with. But when the pandemic hit, and I, I listened to them, I built a great relationship with my banker. When the pandemic hit and we were able to call on our bank and work things out, and not only for our own company, but to help support the, you know, at the time, hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs in our, in our platform, it was that advice from Elban that, that helped us so much. Uh, and then the other piece is we got a great investor out of, of Elban through Golden Seeds. Um, and it was funny, it was an organization, we had pitched to Golden Seeds multiple times. We'd always gotten a no. Finally connected through a Latina investor at Golden Seeds. And they're some of our greatest advocates now. All of them, and it's funny because everybody tries to claim credit for, for bringing us to Golden Seeds. And it was really Elban and, and Adriana that were the ones that, that, that made the connection. Um, and it's been a great and, and very accretive investment for them. So uh, I can't say enough about the program. I think it's something that continues to really fuel us as we, as we grow in a network I continue to lean on um, and highly recommend it for those of you who are growing a business or know someone who's growing a business or want to get involved to support Latino entrepreneurs. I don't think there's a better organization. Thank you. And by the way, I take full credit for the Golden Seed connection. Yes, right? that's, you can that take was it. You can me. Take it. Uh, no, <laughs> it was. I don't. I don't. I try to stay away from all that. But um, but yeah, both of you had had such great journeys through the organization and uh, different times, right? Right before the pandemic, and then currently, um, just graduating a few weeks ago. So I just want to hear, kind of, you've both been through different programs or, or have been part of different organizations and programs, and so. Why was this experience so different than, than maybe other organizations? What was the impact that really led you to be like, wow, this was a transformative experience? And we can start Daniela and then Carolyn. I think the main thing is, and that's kind of how I run my business, is that you understand who you're talking to. And I think that that is the main point or the main pain point with Latino programs and in general with any specific population type of program. And I feel that the needs that we have as entrepreneurs that are scaling programs, Elban truly understands and talk to us in the way that we can really learn and you know, it's like it's like a like a marriage in which that other side understands the other side. So that's what I try to do with my business because we work with Latinos and we felt like in edu the, you know, educational programs for a small business when tailored for small businesses. Or for example, social media. I think that's something that in my opinion is great for entrepreneurs and we got that from social media to our programs and Elban did the same. So for example, AI is important. There you go, AI. Now everybody wants to know about SBA loans, SBA loans. So I think that the, the content is really tailored to, to, to us. And then something that I think is very powerful is that it wasn't only said, but we lived through the mantra of do business with each other and get business for each other. They repeat this to you like 10,000 times, but you really, like after you hear it so much, you feel that, like in the group chats, this week I've had like three of those do business with, with each other, get business for each other, getting business for my peers. I was in Mexico and I saw this person, I was like, this is perfect for Angela, who I recently met, and then they connected and now they're doing business. So I think that that is something that, organizations often just kind of like say, 
but in Elban, it's something that is very powerful, and I feel like if you talk to any Elban alum, they're gonna tell you, do like repeat the mantra. If they're good students like I am, <laughs> they will totally know that mantra. I, and I forgot what the question was. <laughs> uh, that just, was such a great answer. Yeah. Though. <laughs> just I guess like what was what was your experience like? What uh, what was really transformative about it? And yeah, I mean, for me, it was going back to school and just taking the time to, to step back from the day-to-day -day of, of the business, which is so hard, as any of you know who run companies or, or work with entrepreneurs, just forcing the time to go back to school. Um, and it made me think strategically. It's something that I've continued to do even post Elban. I, I carve out my time solo away from the team, no meetings, no nothing, and I just sit and kind of step back and, and I think through a lot of the, the lessons and, and frameworks that we learned from, from Elban uh, in terms of how I, how I grow. I, you know, I, some of the pain points I think we've experienced even post of you know, growing too fast, scaling too fast, and some of the hurdles that come with that, but it was an opportunity I think before it got too far, there were a lot of things I was able to, to implement and apply to my company. And then I, I think the, the network, and it's hard to put a network, I feel like it sounds so fluffy when you say like the value of the network is so great, but the reality is even coming to an event like this, like the number of people that, I mean, I bumped into Daniela yesterday, we hadn't met through, through Elban, and we started talking about, figured out that we had both participated in the program, and the well, connection. Tell them how yeah, we met, them, it's a good story. Yeah. We were getting our nails done at a nail salon, and I saw she had something from Elban up on her phone. I was like, I was like, this is super awkward. I just thought it was on your phone, but hey, <laughs> what are you doing here? And so we ended up connecting, but it builds, it's one of those instant credibility builders that you know somebody's been through the program, you know they're part of this organization. And I think I really like when I'm like looking to build networks, it is where, where do I sort of cut through all of the small talk and all of the need to have to figure out, you know, are we on the same page? Do we think about things the same way? Are we like, are we in the same world? Is there, it, it, pulls all of that out and you know there's like this deep connection. One, culturally, there's a great understanding of where everybody's coming from. Two, we're obviously all entrepreneurs and, and building these businesses. But three, people that are really growing and committed to growth and like Daniela said, like committed to each other's growth to supporting one another. So it, it's been an incredible network, uh, but I think it, it comes down to, to the team and the continuous connection and convening and a lot of these events where we get to be in the same room together as well. I think that, yeah, both of you, great on content, the network. There's so many different elements that make Elban such a strong organization. I want to get to some audience questions, uh, so make sure if you have some, I'm going to ask in, in just a minute. I do want to throw kind of like a curveball question because I, I mentioned it earlier. Um, so we talked about kind of the, the, the effect of the network, but I think something that's really key with Elban is we bring together Latinos from all different types of backgrounds. I actually, we had a conversation about recruitment and somebody had mentioned that we're like, wow, there's so many Elban alumni from Puerto Rico. Why is that, right? Like why, why are there more Elban alumni from Puerto Rico? And after a second I said, well, because everyone's in Puerto Rico is Latino, <coughs> right? When I go to Miami or when I go to Houston, you know, I have to decipher, like, is this a Latino-owned business or not? When I'm in Puerto Rico, it's like, no, they're, they're Latino. Um, but one of the things we see in Elben is that you do have, you know, a third, fourth generation U.S.-born Latino, and you then have Argentinians, Colombians, Mexicans that immigrated three months ago, 10 years ago. There, there's such a spectrum of the Latino community, and, and you had just mentioned it, kind of seeing all of that. So. I guess, what was that like of, of being in a room with people that understand you? And maybe they're from a different background, but they're Latino. So kind of what was that like? And, and I know with your group, there was a, a large delegation of Colombians, um, but there was so much more network to that. And so how did that affect it of, of being in the room with Latinos, but from different kind of backgrounds? And I will say, not only like the, the country where you're from, but Honestly, and I, and I forgot to say this in my previous answer, but that was one of the things that I liked the most about the program. I'm used to sharing a lot with people in the entrepreneurial network from like the startup tech kind of world. 
And for me, this was an opportunity to talk to other people from different businesses that you never imagined. Like these girls making $2 million in $1 tacos. I was like, oh my gosh. And she was telling me about the problems and the things and how she got there. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is pretty incredible. This other guy, he does air conditioners for convention centers. I never thought about who will sell the ACs of the convention centers, but it was pretty interesting. And then this other guy who has this other company of uh, lentils, all sort of products of lentils, and he sells across the United States, but he has like five employees and he subcontracts everything. And I was like, there are different ways of looking at problems, very different from what I'm used to, which is, the startup world and like the lean startup and you know we all knew like my people my, my people i mean people that come from the same industry we all know the same books the same authors we follow the same people in social media and then then these other people who are amazing and now are like my really good friends open a door of like completely new resources ways of tackling problems and that to me was pretty incredible and I will change my answer to the previous question. That was my favorite of this program, like talking to people that think, you always say, you know, you want to be in a room with like like-minded individuals. And this was the first time that I felt that we didn't really think in the same way, but that was what made conversations so powerful. So that is a good point from Elvin. I think, you know, you start on this, this cultural foundation, right? I mean, you show up to your graduation and there's all the, the tias there with their signs and flowers. It's super, like, it's this, this bond, I think, that we all share in terms of the family values of the wonderful things about Latino culture that, that I loved. But I think the, yeah, the variation of the types of companies, I remember, I was thinking actually not too long ago, a, one of the, the businesses there in my, in my cohort was a multi-generational family-owned business and the, the dad who was the CEO of the company at the time was talking about transitioning the company to his children and what they were considering and how they were thinking about succession planning. And I was a couple of years into our business not even thinking about that at all. And now I think at the stage we're at now thinking about, okay, when we grow, thinking about my executive team, what does this mean as, as we evolve? Who is set up? What happens if I need, you know, my business partner just had to be out on medical leave. I'm like, how are we thinking about succession planning and what this looks like at our company and how we're structuring ourselves? And I go back to those conversations. So I think there's things that in the moment don't feel relevant because there's so much diversity in that room. But the reality is we all deal with the same things at some point in time. We're all trying to figure out how do we finance our businesses? How do we get the right talent? How do we think about growing our businesses? How are we expanding into new markets, getting new clients? we're all dealing with the same stuff in some form or fashion, whether we have a lentil company or a taco company or an education company or a tech company, it doesn't matter. We're all trying to figure out the same things. And when you start to connect the dots between these really different experiences of how is, you know, how is the taco company figuring out how they're staffing up and how they're dealing with their teams and how do they manage you know, thousands of employees across, across a company versus you know, the same issue that somebody else is dealing with, you start to connect the dots. That, to me, is where so much of the magic happens. Um, and, and you don't know when those things arise or when those, those points, you know, are meaningful, but I think it, it starts to kind of fuel the foundation for so much of what we deal with in the future as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's one of the big things where I remember, or I have conversations where people say, well, how does it work where you have a tech startup next to a janitorial company, next to a construction company? Like, well, and I said, look, we're all Latinos and Latinas. And there's this element of, I want to help. I want to support, right? I want to give back. And so it doesn't matter what industry. And we do one of these things called giving circles at every kickoff where we randomly select in groups of eight. You, you had just done it. Uh, and these businesses are everything from, from education, ed tech, uh, janitorial, everything. And I remember a couple <laughs> cohorts ago, we did our first one. And we had a group where there was a deep AI tech company from San Francisco, a mechanic shop in San Diego, a pizza shop in El Paso, another tech company. And as we put this group together, I said, how in the world are they going to help each other, right? Because the whole goal of that giving circle is to say, here's what I need. And then somebody to say, here's what I can offer you. And I said, how's a pizza shop going to help a deep AI company in San Francisco, right? The hour goes by and I'm trying to get everybody back into the room and that was the group that I could not get back into the room. 
And when I went to them, I said, hey, let's go. We got to go. And they're like, no, 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 Elian, she's helping me with this connection and, and this and that. And because we have this sort of natural cultural aspect of supporting and, and giving back, they find ways. And they find ways to really, whether it's resources, content, whatever that is, and it's magical to, to kind of see and almost unexpected. So to hear that of, hey, that happened in the cohort and that was four years ago and now I'm putting it together is, is, is really great to see. So we have, I think, a couple minutes left and, and I do want to get to questions. The last thing I want to do is, my favorite part of recruiting is getting our alumni to recruit for us so that I have less work to do. <laughs> so as people tell you, and both of you, by the way, as Latinas, we, we try to over-index on Latinas. So about 27% of qualified uh, Latinas for our program. So when we look at business owners that we're recruiting for our program, only 27% of business owners that are Latina qualify to our program. We want to over-index. We want to make it 50-50. And currently we're at about a 45% acceptance rate. So 45% of our cohorts are Latinas. We want to get to 50-50. And that's hard because Latinas have more challenges. Arturo was speaking about it. Oftentimes, as head of households, they have a lot more responsibilities. It becomes difficult. So as people tell you, hey, look, I have all these things. Do you want me to go back to school? What would you tell them is, hey, drop everything, join LB? <laughs> OK. <laughs> bueno, eh, Do my job. <laughs> No, honestly, going back to school, and I feel like you, Caroline, because I do education and you're the one being educated, but honestly, it was the best experience that I had. I finished homework 10 minutes before it was due, but, <laughs> but I want to say that I stay up till like 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. studying, like the content was pretty amazing. But the best way to sell this is with a real life example. So. One of my given circles was with Raquel, and she does fences. So again, like fences, company, edtech startup, like we didn't see a match at the beginning, and then she was like, Daniela, you know you do WhatsApp training, so I do a lot of my educational content through WhatsApp, and she's like, this is like what the National Fence Association has been looking for for so long. Like we can't get the people who style the fences to log into a platform and to like study in an e-learning way or like years, like that doesn't work. But WhatsApp with like TikTok videos of how to install the fence, like this is what we need. And this was something that I had not even considered. Like if I meet the National Fence Association and she was telling me the numbers are like crazy, I would have never imagined that they would be like my future client. But then Raquel was like, Daniela, this is what you need to do. So I think that going back to school is more than reading a book. That's how we used to think about you know, education in the past. To me, this one minute conversation that I'm just sharing with you is what learning truly means. And I think that the way that you force your mind to think about things outside the, bo the box is something that every entrepreneur that is killing should do. To me, entrepreneurs that are scaling are like CEO of the fire department. Like we're always, you know, turning off fires, but you never get time to think, like literally to think. And if this is good or bad, I don't know, but even like you need to be forced to take that time. And I think that Elban was that for me. Like they forced me to have time to think, to strategize and to say, this is where I want to go. I want to be next level. You know, all these statistics that you all share are amazing. One that really shocked me was that only 3%, and this is not from Elban, but it's a statistic about um, Latinos. This is from 2020, only 3% get to a million. I was like, I need more Latinos to get to a million and to five million and to 10 million. But the only way to do this is to take time to think, how am I gonna go next level? So to me, Elban equals next level thinking. And that's what I learned and that's what I recommend every entrepreneurs that, that wanna go to the next level to do, you need to have time to do that. So don't look at it as, I'm just gonna go study. I'm super nerd, I like reading, I like studying. So I was the perfect fit for like, being a, being a student and going back to school, but if you're not, this program is also for you. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's so important to find a community that, it, 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 the learning was great, the connections were great, the structure was great, the frameworks were wonderful, but at the end of the day, it, it is about more than you. I think so much of what Arturo shared before is that we're part of lifting up this entire community, and that means 
it creates this environment where you want to participate in the giving circles, you want to support one another, you want to connect the other people because we're trying to achieve something that's much bigger than ourselves. One that just feels really good to be a part of. It's very hard to find a group where you're, you're motivated <laughs> to do something like that. We spend so much time in the world of our own businesses doing our things as you know, heads of our companies where we're having to make all the decisions and everyone's turning to us for answers and it's so nice to just step back sometimes and have this really great group where you can say, these are the problems I'm dealing with, here's what I'm going through, here's where I need help, and you know there's, there's a community of people around you that genuinely want to see you succeed because your success means their success. And, and our collective success means the success for so many more that are outside of this program. And to me, that's one of the most incredible things. It's something that, you know, when I look at the community that we're building at, at Hello Alice, it's, it's very much that. Like, this is something so much bigger than us as, as individuals. And I think Elban captures that just in an incredible way that very few, very few networks do with such authenticity and, and such care. And I think props to you guys because that comes so much from, from your team and from the mentors and, and the people that participate in, in making it happen. Absolutely, thank you for that. Okay, we have a couple minutes left, so we'd love to take any audience questions. I don't know if anybody has any uh, for our, our wonderful, I won't answer them, but I promise. <laughs> so are there any questions from the crowd? It could be research, which I can't answer, but, or the program, if there's anything. No? Good, yeah, okay, all right, there we go, yeah. We can go here and then there, yeah. That's fine. I'm just going to put it over there. I'm Roberto Duarte, born New York, grew up in Paraguay, moved from Cleveland to uh, Puerto Rico. And I love this. And I'm very like uh, lucky that I'm here as a young, lucky entrepreneur wearing multiple hats. My question to Alban or you know, to this incredible Latina woman is what, what do you guys do to bring this sort of knowledge or experience to the community? The, the people, our comunidad, that can't pay $150 to hear this because I started two consulting companies, I'm starting another venture, and it's just all because I saw women like you two that were doing it. I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna go and do it. And I'm learning and then I had allies supporting me. But again, I, I'm like the very like small percentage of our community that has that exposure and I'm very lucky. So I wonder what, what is there something or is there something that we can do <laughs> to bring you know these um, role models and experiences to us? I can jump in on that one to yeah, start it. Yeah, so I think one of the things that Elban does really well, and I'll say this as a as an alum and as a, a great partner, um, well, you all are great partners. I wouldn't say we're great partners. <laughs> there is making sure that this this knowledge that there is knowledge transfer. So you saw so many organizations on that slide, like USHCC and and many others. We try to take. I, mean, I try to take everything that I ever learn. I recognize I get to be very fortunate to be in rooms and communities like these and. The majority of people are, are not. And so everything that, that I learn and extract, I always come back to the team and I'm like, hey, we need to figure out how to like share this or connect this expert in or bring this knowledge. And it's part of the reason that we, we built Hello Alice as a model that was really scalable was to say, not everyone gets to be in the room and it's really hard to solve that problem, but we can take the experts in the room and bring them to everybody. Um, for equity, and I think there's so many organizations on the ground that you all partner with that do that in, in great ways. Um, so I think as organizations here, it's a way that you all connect, partner with Elban, share. There's such great, there's so much data and research and information that they have that all of us can take back to the community to help help spread the, the knowledge. And I will say this question, I can answer in two ways. In the, you know, in the organizational way, in business nation, this is what we do all the time, but also in a personal way, this is something that I really take like personal. We need to take this to a lot of people and I have done it through social media. Honestly, people criticize social media all the time. I'm like, this has helped me. We have one million followers, me and my sisters over all social networks and all we do is inspire. And on some days I was, I'm tired. I'm like, you know, I don't want to like keep sharing things. And then you receive this message of this one person that has never has access to a room like this. And then you say inspiration and motivation and resources. I take it for granted because I've been lucky enough to have it, but a lot of people don't. So on a personal level, I share everything. You probably see a post of this in my LinkedIn, <laughs> social media. Like honestly, that's the way that I found that is the easiest to replicate and to get to communities everywhere and to democratize it in a way all the resources that we see. Like if I see something, I'm like, you know, I'm ready to share it because maybe somebody in Colombia or in Miami 
or wherever is going to see it. So that's the way that I personally found that I can, you know, transfer everything that I know and that I see on a daily basis. I post about everything. So that's my personal way I have found of doing that successfully. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect question for, for both of you, right? Because both of you kind of help out the community in, in that sense. Um, the, the last thing that I do want to mention here before we get to the next question is one of the things that we really want to, and, and use the word democratize, right? And, and one of the things we kind of see as a big important part is Stanford is the best business school in the world. How can we bring that to our community? How can we bring that to Latinos and Latinas? And that's what we're trying to do, right? And our program has certain requirements, but our intention with everyone that goes to our program is, okay, now you go to the world and you tell them, right? Now you share it and you become that example. On top of that, you mentioned social media. We try to do as many webinar sessions that's open to everybody. And so that's another way where we're trying to democratize, like, how do we do that? How do we get this word out there? So we just, for instance, did a webinar with a Stanford professor a couple of weeks ago on venture funding and startups, right? And we know that when we put that out there, we had over 300 people join that webinar, right? Yeah. And, and so those are the ways, right? The more we can do that type of work, and again, and then you go and you tell people about it, right? And the other thing that I want to mention, we're really strategic about this is, we, we know that there are experts that are white, we know that there are experts that are Latino, that are black, that are women. What we want to try to do is show the role models, right? We wanted two Latinas on this panel because we know the importance that it is to see us in these panels, to see us in those webinars, right? And so we want to try to do more of that so that people can see. I remember when I first joined the L-Band, it's the last thing I'll say, when I first joined the L-Band, uh, a friend of mine, she was Latina, and when I told her, hey, look, we work with businesses that are a million over, she goes, Latinos own businesses, right? But it's the exposure, right? Oh, Latinos are in tech? Latinas are in tech? Oh, they're in VCs, right? That exposure that starts opening it up. So hopefully, hopefully we answered that question. I know we had a question back there and then I think we got to close out. Yeah. Edgar Cruz, great energy from you guys, and great conversation, happy to be here. Uh, I'd like to know about the opportunities regarding the, the nonprofit sector. I'm a nonprofit founder. I've run been running a nonprofit for about two years now here in Puerto Rico. I'm a local and uh, we do education, so I'd, I'd like to know if there's any opportunities yeah, absolutely. So we, we take nonprofits in every cohort. The operating budget still has to meet our requirements. I can definitely talk to you offline about that. But uh, you had some nonprofits in your cohort. I believe you also had some nonprofits in your cohort. So that's another element that we always try to add, right? How can we connect the nonprofits that are doing work for Latinos and Latinas to, to be a part of it? And, and it can be helping entrepreneurs that are Latinos and Latinas, but also, for instance, this next cohort will have one that works with <coughs> California farm workers, which are traditionally Latinos and Latinas, right? So we'll always work with nonprofits if it's getting them in the program to help them scale and grow the work that you're doing. And if not, it's seeing how can we connect you and plug you into what we're doing. Um, we've worked with USHEC and so many different nonprofits, so we can definitely find, find a way to do that. I don't know if there's anything else, but, but that's essentially what we can do. So definitely happy to talk offline about that, yeah. Okay, I think we're at time. Um, I want to thank all of you for, for being here, listening to our research, listening to our two phenomenal panelists and Elban alumni. Again, elban.us, that's our website. You can find all the information there. Our next program starts October 12th. Uh, we will be at Stanford for that kickoff weekend, the nine weeks, and then graduation in December. And then our Elban Startup Accelerator, which is our tech-based program, starts in the spring of next year. And our research will be between February and March of next year. That event, we convene over a thousand different partners and ecosystem. Uh, so, so definitely happy to have you there. Hopefully you follow us. I wanna just close out, quick plug. What, where can people follow you? How can, what do you need? What do you want? Tell them, give them the, the <laughs> no, plug. Hermanas Carvajalino, Instagram, there you can find me. Some other places, but Hermanas okay, Carvajalino. Wait, spell it out. Hermanas, like sisters, and then the last name. Carvajalino is C A R V S and Victor A J A L I N O. So that's like my main place where you can find me. Awesome. Yeah. You can find me at Carolyn Rods on just about any platform um, or Hello Alice at Hello Alice underscore com on Instagram. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you so much. Yep. Yeah.